Welcome to another war game review from theplayersaid.com. My name's Alexander. And I'm Grant. And I'm Ryan. So, Ryan, appreciate you joining us today. Of course. Uh, we grew Ryan in the lab. <laughs> right? <laughs> he enjoys war games, and we keep him in the closet. We yes. bring him out once in a while. Trotting out for three play games. Yeah, I don't mind it. <laughs> so, today we played Conquest and Consequence from GMT Games. Uh, this is the new kind of three-player CDG designed by Craig Basinki, I believe. We decided that's so, what we were Sorry if that's not your name and I butcher it. Apologies. Uh, but Ryan is from a YouTube channel slash content creator account called Cataclysm Now. Yep. You may well have seen uh, his videos. There's a lot of solitaire playthroughs and reviews and thoughts on those kinds of things. So, And really a student of history, I, I, I think. Your comments are very steeped in a lot of reading, I, I feel like. Right, yeah. yeah. Yes, Agreed. unlike myself, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. who just, just goes through and says the most slanderous <laughs> things about people. No idea what I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh, we played a game and the blue bits were fun. So if and you want some, like if you want some intelligent analysis, <laughs> go to Cataclysm Now yeah. in YouTube, and uh, he's got some great content on there. Uh, also, a local Hoosier. Yep. Yeah. So he was able to come down, and we started this. Well. You arrived at house at nine. I don't know when we started playing. About there was ten. A lot, a lot of set up and kind of going through the rules. We played, what, probably five, six hours of this game? Maybe seven? Between right. lunch and discussions that we had. Yeah, yeah. Probably six hours we played. So, if you were focused, you could finish it in a day. Yeah. <laughs> if you were... <laughs> yes. And if you're unfocused, two days. But uh, Well, and we only made it through 1943. We only had yes. two more turns to do. Yeah, so. we, we decided to call it because it was getting too late. Yes. And we, we would have had two more turns, but it's it's getting there. Yes. Right. And I'm not sure that the outcome would have been much different. I'm not sure it would have changed that significantly. No. Yeah, and, you know, at the end of our play, it was extremely tight, and there was an equal amount of victory yeah. points between the leaders, so... I, I enjoyed the fact that it was very close all the way through. There was never a point at this where I was kind of like, oh great, someone's run away with it and there's not much we can do about it. Right? Yeah. And like I was saying to you earlier that I prefer mm -hmm. a tight game. Um, rather than a runaway. Yeah, I'd ra actually I'd rather yeah. lose a tight game than mm -hmm. win a blowout. Yeah. And just like run roughshod across In the board. Interesting. Yeah. interesting. <laughs> I, I love winning blowouts. It happens so rarely. <laughs> That's why, that's why I relish them so much. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so this is a three-player game. There's a two-player option, which... Ignores the Soviets, right? Yeah, Basically. I don't know if I would have any interest in playing that, frankly. Well, it would be interesting to try it, just to see how that would be different. You would have a guaranteed naval war. Yeah, guaranteed direct, yeah, more direct like, conflict but, between the United States and, and Japan. This We had some, but not not. And it's predecessor later. Triumph and Tragedy, a design ground up as three player games. Mm -hmm. It's a card driven style game. There's economics of managing your faction's resources and industry and population as you take more ground. You're using that to develop technologies or build more industry or from a different deck of cards get combat actions or other diplomatic influences so there's a lot of stuff to try and manage in this grand strategic pacific theater game mm -hmm. and being able to do that with three people instead of two just gives you uh, a much larger dynamic and there's a bit more of table talk of like all right yeah let's let's do this verbal non-aggression pact mm -hmm. so that you know you can do this and i can do something else well, it was interesting because, you know, me as the Japanese, you as the Soviets, you know, the, the, the Chinese Civil War is very central to this game. It is yeah, a it's big, massive. big part of yep. it. And, you know, we're kind of, you start ca calculating victory points and you're looking and you're like, okay, he, he's somewhere near the top and we got to kind of combine. So we did start having that table talk. I found that extremely fascinating because, you know, in World War II, the Soviets and the Japanese really didn't come to direct blows until... Until 1945. The very end, when, when they it was were like, pretty much the over. Soviet, until the Soviets were like, well... <laughs> what was it? It was, a land, it was a land, land grab at that point. Right. Yes, it was. Stalin was like, oh, let's they, just go ahead and take those. We don't want Roosevelt oh, to have all the... The war's already right. over. Mm. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> grab some stuff. So it was interesting to see us kind of working together, but also in the back of our minds, I'm sitting there thinking... Not, not trying to work together too much. Right? Well, and you even said that a couple of times. I, I don't want to do that because that helps too much. Yeah. And that was an interesting dynamic that I love those kinds of dynamics in coin, the coin series games. Yeah. and Because you want to work together, but you don't want to work too much together. Yeah. You, you know, and... And that's where multiplayer games really shine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, 
that, so there's a few multiplayer games out there where it's like we're all sitting around a table playing our own little thing, mm -hmm. and that's I don't enjoy that. I want to get people together around a table and we're interacting frictionally on the table, but also we've got some discussions and some negotiations going on of like what can we do here? Oh, now I'm not do I'm done with you. Let's let's work on this because I made a boo boo kind of a thing. Right, it's literal triangulation because like mm -hmm. it's it's a it's a three legged stool. You know, if you have one player collapse, then it upsets the entire. So in terms of like yeah. international, you know, real politic, you do want to hobble your opponent, but not so much that your other opponent can really take advantage yeah. of the fact that they've... So, and like I said, it's interesting that they foisted, I shouldn't say foist, but put brought this system to this theater, because you were indicating sort of as the Soviets, they're... Yeah, I, I played the Soviets in this one, and basically the actual Soviets themselves did almost nothing. Um, a few attacks here and there. But yeah, but like my main focus China. is trying to establish communist China. So I'm pumping as many resources and most of my actions and stuff into building up Chinese communist forces and being able to attack nationalist China and then, you know, opportunely trying to take a couple bits off of Japan, maybe. Um, but like it's... It's, I felt like that's very different from Triumph and Tragedy, where you've got these three massive powers, all of which are juggernauts, and no one, like, you know, Soviets can sit back and do it, but, so, like, the onus is on the Russians to go and do something, mm -hmm. on, on the Germans to go and attack them, to stop them from winning. Right. But I felt like here, because there's this absolute churning meat grinder of this Chinese civil war, that at least I'm invested in it, but, like... Yeah, the actual Russians don't do a whole lot. I yeah. throw in a couple units to support that, but, you know, if I do that, it kind of changes my victory conditions coming out of the Chinese Civil War, so can I can I get away with not committing my own Russian troops? It's interesting, but yeah, I, I did a little bit less, I think. But but it's also, that that's exactly what history was, right? Yeah. The, the Soviets did not have the resources and the manpower to fight as as vehemently as they were fighting on the on the eastern yeah, front, they've got more pressing issues. Yeah, so this was kind of a, a different focus. It was a different uh, struggle, and I thought that was shown very well in the yes. way you played and the way you had to play because of your resource limitations. And you know, you had like six production most of the time. We had yeah. anywhere from I've got uh, six. ten to twenty. But right. then, so it's really important to get this communist china going because then they've you know they had six production seven production by the end of it as well and so that equals a good amount of, of kind of doing all this what was interesting about playing this, the kind of this russian common turn faction is that i have a lot of extra rules or just different rules as well and everyone's kind of got their own little bolshevik cool playbook yeah, yeah it was like we yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like I've, I've constantly have my nose in section 16 uh, and 17 of this rule book because there's all these partisans. A bunch of which, secret communist yeah, powers. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. I, I, secret I'm communist superpowers. Putting out all there. these partisans who are just like gumming things up. I'm researching uh, guerrilla warfare where they become guerrillas and they can fight back against being suppressed. And then I can also, you know, march Russian units in and they can turn some of those partisans into like actual militia units. Yeah, he's putting down P's and I'm like, oh, what's that P? It's a partisan. And he flips in. It's like, it's a G. I'm like, what is that yeah. doing? I'm like, oh, yeah, we'll yeah, find yeah. out. Don't, don't suppress that now. <laughs> Well, and Alexander kept that rule book pretty tight. Yes. He wouldn't allow us to really read <laughs> through it, so I'm going to blame that. But one thing that I know you did, the loyalty cost, you were able to play a card that dropped it. Yeah. What did it drop it from? So Was it six? Yeah, it was normally, I have to spend six factories to increase communist uh, China's loyalty. Yeah. Which, you know, increases victory points and increases production value. And then, yeah. And six, that's a lot for the Russians. It's because you've, extremely you're only expensive. getting three, maybe four cards a turn. That that can be really challenging. Yeah, and so then I, I researched the land reform, drops it from a six to a four, and you're like, okay, four. On kind average, of made the world of difference. On average, that's two of those industry cards. So yeah. I'm, then I'm like able to kind of bop that a bit more. Which, I, I thought that was interesting. You yeah. also did that guerrilla investment. I'm not sure we saw it really play yeah, out I, a whole I, lot. I couldn't get it to pay off because Nationalist China had such big stacks. It was like, what's, what's one little... Cadre going to do against that? I don't and, know if that's and that was one thing I noticed. We we kind of allowed them to to, to build up, right? Well, I mean, I had a similar experience to Alexander here. Like as the United States, there's no incentive with as much as I wanted mm -hmm. a naval 
uh, like a traditional naval war. There was no incentive for me to declare war on Japan, certainly not the Soviets. Uh, so I just put all my time and resources into keeping the nationalist Chinese mm -hmm. alive. Um, I'm pumping a bunch of units in there. Yeah, because you're kind of a dual faction. You can spend your resources I I anywhere you want. You can't spend the Chinese resources on right. USA stuff, but you can spend the USA on British and... Right, yeah, we haven't nationals. really mentioned the British yeah. either. Like, they didn't really come in... Because war wasn't declared between the... The primary factions, would mm -hmm. you traditionally think about the Pacific War, until was it forty three? Forty three, yeah. Yeah, and that was a raid. That was a raid on Manila, a raid in spring or a summer. But then the Manila didn't fall until. Autumn oh, it was a raid fall. in the spring, and then again in the summer, and then again in the fall, <laughs> and it finally happened. So. <laughs> Grant's rolling was terrible. Oh my gosh! It, was, <laughs> it, was, it, it wasn't terrible. If I was playing a traditional war game, I was rolling fours, fives, and sixes all day long. Yeah, right. But yeah, yeah, you were. Yeah, it was because it, you want to low, roll low here. Yeah, it was. It was interesting. So I, we talked a little bit about it. Had some of those rolls gone more traditionally, if they'd have been average, yeah, right. average, three to five hits on 15, 16, 17 dice, which was yeah, you're rolling twenty ones. I mean, you should at least hit yeah, three. You know? I was getting zero to one all the time. Yeah. So so that might have changed things. It might have. You know, I think the Japanese really need to clear off the coast. Get those three yes. territories, in, including the capital, um, Nanking, right? Isn't that what? Yep. Yeah. Get that taken care of, and then I don't care about the rest of national Or at least, China. In I mean, even if you don't fully conquer them, just set up a system where you're invested, and mm -hmm. there's an ongoing conflict. Well, you're holding them, right? You're, yeah, that pins you're just keeping the combat. Them and, right, and then, because then that also deprives the Chinese the ability to then reinforce them. Right, the so bolster, even yeah. if you're tying that up, you can then spend considerable resources expanding or even just positioning, because, I mean, the Central Pacific was pretty denude of virtually any ships or, or yeah. garrisons. It was just, it was kind of crickets out there. Well, we were all, I was focused on... Well, and that's sure, one of the things but... about this game you have to understand. This is a sandbox game. Yeah, right. You can do anything that you want. And it's... you. So this is the game that you want to play, and it's like, let's mess around and do some ahistorical stuff. There's a lot of Pacific War games out there where you're like, all right, we're going to kind of mimic what was done, and then you change a few things. This one, you can kind of go hog wild and do whatever you want in this, which is fun to play around with, what, but just understand. Isn't that, that right? kind of what makes it novel and interesting? I think that so, yeah. You, you can do that, and that's that's one of the things I love about this system, is you can kind of do anything yes. and try anything. You may not win, and it may not pay no, off. No, but, but, but it was interesting, though. It was, it was interesting. And I... Not having played a lot of these, the multiplayer like sandbox type games, it's really interesting because when you look at history, you, a lot of people may mistake it in terms of like that this is on rails, that it had to have happened like this, mm -hmm. and it kind of removes a bunch of decision points that, you know, because World War Two in a weird way is like one of it's it's an IP. You know, people look back and and they're like, this is an intellectual property where they had these guns and these weapons and these like landmark. But it kind of removes the human element where people think and like, mm -hmm. what decisions were they making and what what did victory look like? And you know, it's not always a raid on Pearl Harbor and you know yeah, the Battle of yeah. Midway. Like those are just how that happened. But those campaigns or those battles could have happened in a, a, a myriad of places. Mm -hmm. Obviously strategically important, but in this and this type of game emphasizes that. And the fact that necessarily a war didn't have to it didn't have to break out. I mean it's likely between mm -hmm. Japan and the United States in terms of their yeah, their worldview and their strategic outlooks. It's it's probable, but it doesn't mean it has to happen. Well it's the other thing that I think is very cool about this is there's a pendulum, right? So Japan is kind of the power at the beginning of the game. They're swinging to the right, and they're kind of in control, and they've got a whole bunch of stuff, and they got all the units on the board, and it's it's incumbent upon that player yes. to really make hay while the while the sun is shining. Right. And if you don't make hay quick enough and get to some of your objectives, that pendulum is then going to swing back to, to to the U.S. Right. And it we were starting to see that where. You've got so many ships coming, Gosh, which is US. a really, really cool mechanic, the right. way that kind of happened. Dropping two and three pip, like, yeah. constructed, like, on the board. Which normally, that takes two to three rounds to yeah. get a ship from one as a cadre 
to a two power and a three power. So their ability, they they geared up, right? And they they produced ships. Yes. That's what they did, and bullets and all the other stuff. But it it is that pendulum, and you got to strike when that iron's hot. You got to do. Yeah. It, it's interesting. The Soviets, I feel like there's a middle way area, kind of in the middle of that pendulum swing. Yeah, I, and like I'm here almost as like a a balancing act. Mm-hmm. Because if you guys just like kill each other to death, I'll I'll probably sweep in a win at the yeah. end. If you guys bleed yourselves dry. So you have to do enough, it's, you know, and part of that is trying to just dominate China as yep. the Japanese. If you can drive out the communists, I just don't have the points to it. So then I'm like, oh no, i got to do something. Maybe I'll preemptively invade Manchuria, or like, yep. I've got to then start doing a whole lot of stuff. But yeah, if the Japanese and Americans just go at it, then, you know, communism mm-hmm. can flourish in that vacuum of power. But like most... Pacific games, and frankly, a lot of war games. I think efficiency is extremely important, yeah. especially for the aggressor. And Japan has to go move out, take all this stuff, and do it quickly and efficiently. Yeah. And that's that. You know, you're the most of you die. One or two attacks, not yeah. Five. You want to strike, get it done, move yeah. on, and keep that ball rolling, because then everyone's kind of on the back foot, trying to react, 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 and then it's. You keep that initiative and that momentum going. Yeah. And we saw that in Triumph and Tragedy as well. Like, the Germans have to be aggressive and they have to get mm-hmm. it done. Because if they, if they can't, then it grinds to a halt and it's, you know, you're Well, almost... if the Germans, and, and I think in the Japanese here, if they don't get what they need done, yeah. it spells doom. I, it really, for them. Yes. For them. It, it's going to mean somebody else is going to fill that vacuum and, and take it home. So it, it, it's interesting. The other thing I really like about this game, and I liked it in Tri- uh, TNT, was the political side of it, yeah. where some of your cards, those are called action cards, right? Yes. You're, you're getting different areas on the map, you know, Sing Tao and blah, blah, and you're trying to influence those to bring them onto your side. Make them a protectorate and then a satellite so that, one, you get the resources and population, and two... You can build units in there and yeah. move through it. It's right? less spaces I have to invade. Yeah. It's very Euro gamey in that way. Right? Yeah. Where, like, you, it's not quite bidding, but you are sitting on a card and you kind of want to pass and see what the other mm-hmm. players are going to do because you don't want to necessarily show your hand in terms of I'm trying to influence this region. Yeah. Um, because it's actually expensive. Those forts, these forts, ten, they turned out to be, they're. Very vicious, they're vicious in combat, and so if you try to move into a province that isn't fully your satellite, mm-hmm. even if you have influence over it, um, they will they will fight to defend their territory, mm-hmm. and it's expensive. And then with the prices anyway of like the the, the limits, the yes. game is sort of inversed in terms of most games have just move like terrain affects movement allowance, mm-hmm. where the terrain in this affects the number of units that can pass over a border, which like upends very the usual calculations yeah. of like. Where what you're moving where, that's a, and that's a that's a, a a reasonably common kind of block war game type of thing. A lot of the Columbia ones have that similar concept, and so you're like, I can move one across here and then two out through this border, but the ter- the terrain in mainland China is so punishing in a lot of places. <laughs> Everything is mountain, river, desert. That yeah. like. In way, the ways that some of these connections are done, it's like you can bring one ground unit, one, and and then like you're like okay, throw throw in the air force as well, mm. and they're going against you know they're going up against like a fortress which rolls two dice immediately, hitting on fours or less against a ground unit. The ground unit dies, and then your air force is like see you, right? Yeah. Like it's it it makes this so tough, and so you're like build forces, build forces, and then you're like throwing a guy in trying to get. You know, I'm going to do a spring offensive and then a summer offensive so I can get another guy in and another guy in trying to make it work. But if you do all of that, that's where your cards are going. And you can't do diplomatic influences. Yeah. Yep. This is at its core, this CDG, and you're like, every time you're buying a bunch of action cards, you're not buying a bunch of industry cards. So your production's not going up maybe as much as you can. And that, there's a lot of things to balance, and that's one of the really cool parts about all CDGs, and especially this one, because there's so many options. Like... Each card has like three or four things that it can do, right. and then Multi there's two decks card, of cards, yeah. and all of it's different. Mm. And you, they look the same though; their backs are the yeah, same, which so, I wish they were so, a little different. Well, so but, no one knows. Well, what yeah, that's, that's right. right. <laughs> that's why. Duh. But like, 
It's it's yeah. And and the other part of it, one of my favorite things about this, when you buy, when you do your production, buy a couple of units, strengthen a couple of units, and then you like draw some cards and you face down, and you don't get to see what those yeah. are until you've finished all of your buying of units. And yeah, stuff. you don't like take one card and go, oh, that's what I need. I'm I not buying any more yes. cards. Yes. Absolutely or, none of that. I have to buy another card. You're yeah, like, I, I I'm like buying that. six cards because I need two. Yeah. I need X amount of factories, and that's going to get me them. Hopefully, right. Well, that was another. You, you made the comment about expensiveness of trying to invest in that political side. You know, there was a time early in the game where I I could just see we were going, we were going up against each other and in that political realm. And I thought to myself, what if I had just put all that into units, literally, mm -hmm. and attacked and fought off that neutral fort and just avoided buying those types of cards. That's what, I wonder... That's what fascists tend to do. Yeah, <laughs> right, dispense right. With diplomacy. Like, yeah, you, you buy three action cards, and you've hopefully get in three different offensive seasons, and then, you and just then you've got, and you do ten units, units, and that's your yeah. 13 resources, and go for it. But I think about that, I'm like, oh boy, I wonder if that would have been better for me, because I Maybe. spent a lot of stuff yeah. on those cards well, early sweet on. talking some some uh, some warlords and tribal <laughs> Chinese yeah. guys. Just crush them. Which they, which yeah, they famously didn't do. Yeah, they just Right right. But I, yeah, I, you know, that's one of the cool things about this game. Also, is that you can do it. You can have, right. you can buy thirteen action cards and you just can. go whole diplomacy if you wanted yep. to, and then you're gonna get a bunch of satellites. That's gonna pop up a bunch of your units in those spaces, and then next turn you're like, sweet, I can strategic move th through half the map. Yeah, and, right. and yeah. then I can like go on and but do Lord help elsewhere. you if your opponent is planning a strategic or a, an assault or an attack or a surprise yeah. attack. Yeah, like that was my fear as the United States. I'm like, gosh, I, I'm going in all. With these diplomacy you know, cards and, or, and not just diplomacy, but the uh, yeah the factory investments. stuff. And I'm like, I don't have any campaign cards held back. If yeah. he strikes Pearl Harbor or Manila, yeah, you, I, you can no way to I take can't it back. even respond this year. I'm yeah, I'm, right. I'm, You're stuck. Right. So you do have to. I mean, you don't have to, but it, it is incumbent it, yes. for you to play it's, conservatively. You, you, got, you got to keep it all in your brain, <laughs> right? Yeah. But in general, it helps reframe, I think, from a historical point of view, because oftentimes the Pacific War is generally like, bam, and then like, yeah. you know, China's a... A side note. Or like a, a tracker. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like yeah. Like, this is how the yeah. Chinese... It, yes. Millions I of agree. people fighting and dying, and we're just going to move. Yeah. yeah. Roll, roll a die. But I, it was a four, but one pip. Yeah, but yeah, the 5,000 yeah. Marines landing, you know, at like Tarawa, like that, that's... It helps reframe it in terms of like, this in... I'm not saying it's the most important feature of the Pacific mm -hmm. War, but it helps bring it back to it, a yeah. proper place. It's yeah. extremely important. Right. Without without the Chinese holding out against the Japanese, I mean, the Pacific War would have gone way differently. And then also yeah. it brings in the shadow of the Cold War. I mean, and that's, that's the thing that a lot of games don't necessarily deal with. I mean, some, some do. I, I shouldn't make blanket statements. But you have the idea that, like, even if you do triumph over Japan... Where's the shadow of communism? Yes, the, fall? the, like, con that, the yeah. consequence part of conquest and consequence. Right, yeah, it's right. very evident. You get to the end of the war yeah, and you assess absolutely. what's going on. And you're like, oh, huh? How about that? Very aptly named, I think. Yeah, well, yeah. same with triumph and tragedy. I mean, it's yeah, got, yeah, it's got Ch Chamberlain yeah. on the front. You know, who's, um, you know, associated with the the, tr the tragedy of appeasement. Yeah. But you know, yeah, we defeated the Nazis, but half of Europe fell under. Communism, Communism sway yeah, yeah, for, and, for a half a century. And millions of people died, and it right. was <laughs> rationing for ten years after the war. So, okay. <laughs> like <laughs> tragedy, the tragedy yeah, part. Like it, it, you know, war is never a good thing. Okay, so conquest and consequence. I'm going to show you how this game works, at least some of it, because it's very complicated. And then we'll wrap up with a few final thoughts. So here's a look at the map, and <laughs> this this game's got a lot in it. Um, so I get, we, I'm not sure we're going to be able to get to go through kind of everything that's in here. Um, the rules themselves, we got this nice little glossy, you know, 25, 26 page rule book. But it, it was at times a little bit, the way that, that some things are put in, it wasn't my favorite rule book in the whole wide world. But having played TNT and kind of knew what I was getting myself into, it was mostly okay. So this is a big game. We played for probably about... We played about six hours, and we got we finished at the end of 1943. There were two more years we could have done, but the time kind of got away from us. Um, now, if we were to play this again, we'd be able to complete the whole thing probably in the same amount of time, and then 
the third time, you know, the game says four to six hours on the box, you'd be able to get it down much shorter. There was lots of humming and hawing and a lot of rules reading in this one, so just know that's what you're getting yourself into. So, the map itself is divided up into regions, uh, so obviously there's lots of different sea zones, and there's lots of different kind of island groups and types. So you've got, and there's a, there's a little there's a little key over here. So you've got these little small dotted ones, which is like you can put one unit on them, that little single islet. Then you have these islet groups. So this is the whole of the Gilba Islands, including Tarawa. Um, you can put um, a, a number of units on those, and then you've got these hexagonal ones. These are um, the same as those, but these are also bases. And the exchange of those is going to award victory points um, to the captor of those. So that's kind of those. And then most of the most of the countries and and regions are divided up, and then also labeled. So Vietnam is made up of this region, which has Saigon, and this region, which has Hanoi. But uh, the the diplomacy card says Vietnam. So you get it. You get an influence in kind of the country which is composed of two regions. And generally speaking that's the case uh, in uh, in a lot of places, but f with China for example, the diplomacy is against this specific region. It's, there isn't a China diplomacy card, like there's a Vietnam one that gives you both of these. It, it's specifically to the Yunnan province. So you you kind of got to get your mind around some of that stuff. Some of, some of you know, I do a diplomacy and it's going to go into the the Dutch East Indies. It's all of these, even though it's made up of a number of different uh, regions that I'll have to individually invade and, you know, so whoever gets the diplomacy on those first is going to have a, something of an advantage because they might have to invade fewer of those <laughs> over the course of the game. So, that's, that's kind of how the board is laid out of countries and they try to make things as clear as possible. Um, each of the different regions has uh, different borders on them, so there's like impassable terrain like this, which I presume is kind of like big, and then there's mountains, and then there's uh, rivers, and then there's just regular dotted lines, I don't know if you can see many of those. These are, these are plains, but then there's also forest, and then there's desert ones as well. And there's again, there's a little key in the corner, and it's how many blocks can you move across that border in a given act, in a given command card. Um, so basically everything is one except for planes. And so, th like many block games, the emphasis is on maneuver and flanking, because if I'm attacking from here to here, I'm gonna put one unit across. But if there's a big stack of guys, one unit, not gonna do anything. So, and it's, and it's ground unit, you can fly as many planes in as you want. But you might move one ground unit in here, you might move one from here, so now you've got two. You might also conduct a sea landing as well at the same time, but make sure it's with a marine unit, because they can attack during uh, amphibious assault. Regular infantry can't, they just kind of move and kind of sit there and absorb hits. Then they can attack in a subsequent battle. And, this, and then you're flying in planes and, and, uh, and, and ships as well. So that's, you know, like all block games, like we said, maneuver and trying to get a beachhead so that you can spread out and get guys in through different angles is how you're going to get big attacks going. Because normally crossing and cross like doing naval landings, you can only bring one guy across a coastal. But so you can bring one guy in this way, but you can bring one guy in this way. So you, you want to plan and make sure that you can bring in a couple guys. Maybe you land here and you can bring in a guy from Borneo as well, and make sure that you can maximize some of these attacks that you need to do quickly. You know, some of them you can kind of have this kind of milling grinder going on. But if you need to do something decisive, you need to bring as many people as possible. And it's not just I move everyone in. You've got to you've got to be able to get them in with movement points and to different angles. So if I'm placing you know some fleets here, that means that you can't just go around and invade from this way. They have like a pinning interdiction action. And so how you do all this is very very interesting and has a lot to contend with um, from a from a map standpoint as well. But the core of the game is almost an economic game. If, if we're really honest with ourselves. You're going to hand a, a hand of cards, some of which are going to be these action cards, which have uh, two different options of diplomacy, of, of when you're doing diplomacy. And they also have a, this is a summer command, that triggers on a W, which is very late, right? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, it's the whole alphabet, W is very late, and you can activate seven units when it's your turn. 
Um, there's spring, summer, and then a block avis, and a fall and a winter. So there's four seasons, four opportunities to play these command cards, but a summer command can only be in a summer. A spring command only in the spring, right? Makes sense. So you try to get these to like do actions and move stuff on the board, but you also have this card economy where you're trying to get from this deck up here, the investment deck, you're trying to get some of these because these allow you to spend factories to increase your production on your production track. If you have more production, you can buy more cards, you can build more units. Um, but you're also looking for, these have technologies on them too. So if I have both of these in my hand, I can play them and I get the heavy bomber technology. My air forces now move three spaces instead of two. Three spaces is very, very strong. Um, so, I, I, you know, when you buy cards, you're trying to spend your production to get enough cards to do the actions that you want, but also get some enhancements and benefits or invest in your infrastructure so that you can get more and get your kind of economy rolling early in the war. But you also got to spend those on buying units, upgrading the units that you have, repairing units. You got to do all of that. And uh, it's a it's a really interesting, and that's, that's one of the parts of the game I actually like, um, because when it comes to your production turn, let's say you've got like 12 production, cool, you've got 12 points to spend. What you cannot do is like, buy some cards, see what you've got, and then do some units. When you buy cards, you say, I'm going to buy three cards, one, two, three, and they stay face down, and you're not allowed to look at those until you finish your production phase. So you might have total trash here, and you say, well... I'm gambling that I've got what I want here, so I'm going to buy four of these investment cards because I need to improve my economy. Okay, cool. I've spent seven of my 12, now I've got five. So I'm going to improve a unit. I'm going to improve a unit. Oh, I need another unit. So I'm going to build a unit, and then I'm going to improve a couple over here, and all of a sudden you're done. So if you've had a big attack and you've taken a bunch of wounds, repairing those takes up all your production, and then you're going to have fewer cards and you'll be less proactive in the game. Uh, in, in the subsequent year. And, and I just really like that balancing act that you have to do. And, it, you know, it shows the consequence of, you know, a huge defeat or something that's in, uh, like an ongoing meat grinder, uh, which, you know, a lot of the, the Japanese involvement in China was. They had to commit so much stuff here that just sapped manpower and resources from them that could have been used elsewhere in the war. And you see that in the European front and in Triumph on Tragedy as well. But it's just a fun thing to kind of play around with, of pulling those cards blind, r gambling, repairing some units, and then you kind of look at your cards and you're like, great, I have very small factory cards. These are very inefficient for buying new factories. And I've got two spring offensives. Well, I can only use one, so that's useless. And I've got a fall one as well. So I, don't, I can't do anything in the summer. And, and so then you'd like kind of... What am, I, what am I trying to do with those cards? So you kind of do all this production, and then you have this government phase where you're playing your cards for diplomacy. So I'm going to play one for Yunnan. And then the next player says, well, I'm going to play one for Inner Mongolia. And then the next player says, well, I'm going to play this one, which has a cool event on it. And as the, as the Japanese player, it gives me one of three options that I can place on. And I'll immediately put one in Inner Mongolia. So they put one in Inner Mongolia. And then you keep going until you don't want to do any of those anymore. You know, the next during the government phase, this is where you're going to do your, oh, I'm going to do my heavy bombers. I place two cards that match. I keep one as a reference, and the other one goes into the discard pile. So there's fewer heavy bomber technologies in there for everyone else. Takes them a bit longer to maybe catch up and research those. Or what you can do is you can keep this hidden. You play both of them face down. And that limits, that reduces your hand size by one. But no one knows what technology that you've purchased. Now they might start going and doing these espionage cards to go and have a little look. But that also is an investment to them. But you know, <laughs> when you start, uh, when you like, if no one knows what you got, they might think they're safe. And all of a sudden you whip those out. My bombers can move three. You sail in a massive force. You do huge bombing raid. Uh, and they're like, it catches people out. It makes you more flexible, and they might not be able to predict as well. And it's a, it's a cute little aspect to the game, which I do enjoy. You kind of do all this, go back and forth till everyone passes, and once everyone's done with that, then you resolve the diplomacy. So uh, in this one, we played one in Inner Mongolia, um, and so I get a point in Inner Mongolia. Cool, we're going to put one in Inner Mongolia. They had one as well, so one for one, they kind of cancel out, and we had one left. 
Um, they played one, well, they play one in the Yunnan province. So Yunnan gets one, and Yunnan cancels one of the ones that was in there. Cool. And so these are constantly shifting. Once they, if you can get three, this becomes your territory. You get sole rights to it. You can move in there. You can recruit in there. No big deal. Other up until then, you get kind of get you get the population, but uh, you know not not much else out of that. Oh, the, the muster value at least. And uh, and and as you get you get more and more influence. Some of these have resources that are going to help your production. Some of them have. Um, lots of population or their cities that helps the Chinese Civil War participants these little proxy powers uh, and it's 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 a neat little aspect to the game that you either commit very hard to but that hampers everything else that you're trying to do or you kind of do a little bit of and you're not very strong but you might be strong militarily so you don't care about diplomacy right diplomacy by arms and all that once that's all completed you then move on to kind of the command phase and this is where you take turns you're going to place a command card so oh it's spring i'm going to play a spring command card and then this player over here is like i'm going to play a spring command card you play these face down once everyone's played one or everyone's passed you reveal them all and then you conduct these in alphabetical order so the soviet player played one that triggers on a c they played one that triggers on an i c goes first so I want to see, I'm going to, so I'm going to go first, I'm going to activate four units. So pick four units, they're going to move, they might attack, they might do strategic moves, kind of things that you'd be expecting for. Once I've done that, all my moves are completed, we then do any battles that I've initiated, or any continuing battles where I was the aggressor in an earlier turn. And then once I've completed with that and done my supply checks, then we go to the, the uh, like the USA player, they activate six units do six moves, then they do all of their battles that they trigger, then do a supply check, basically. And so, the way in which you play these and game them, because you might have a spring card, but you say, I pass, then the next player passes, and then they say, I am going to play one, so they play one, and you are waiting for them to see what they were going to do, and then you say, okay, I'm going to play one also. But the risk is, is that they also pass. Now everyone's passed in a row, and you didn't get to use your spring command. So you get that whole little kind of bluffing and trying to push your luck element in some of those. Some of the times it's very obvious what you need to do, but sometimes you can try to be a bit cagey and kind of wait and see if it's opportune or not, or if you need to react. Uh, and then you do you do kind of do the same thing for a summer phase. We play all our summer offensives. Then there's a blockade phase. If you're blockading people, they're going to get blockaded. They're going to have a reduced production. And then there's a fall phase for fall commands. And then there's this winter phase where the US and the Japanese can do um, strategic redeploys. Or uh, if things are going real bad in Russia, the Russians can play any card in the winter. And it's a full-blown offensive within Russia. You know, winter offensives in these red areas up here. They can't do it anywhere else on the map. But, uh, you know, if they're being invaded, things are going really badly for them. They get that extra turn to, like get an extra go on them, which, which can really help to fight things back and kind of seal the deal, so to speak. So, how combat actually works, very similar to every block game you've ever played. Uh, you're going to roll a number of dice equal to the strength pips that you currently have, and they trigger in an order of activation which is not on the play aids, which is very frustrating. Um, that was one thing that it was, I had like a, the list of the activation order is, here on a sidebar in a rule book, but for the life of me, could not find anything useful on the play aids for that, which was very frustrating. So, fortresses fire first, then air forces, carriers, subs, fleets, tanks, infantry, marine, militia, and convoy. Um, and so, you roll dice based on what you're targeting. And so, you know, we had some massive engagements, but we'll, we'll just get kind of a small one here. So, let's say we've got a three strength air force, a three strength infantry. And they're going to go up against um, a two-strength fort. And let's get a two-strength tank. And we'll get another, we'll get a one-strength infantry. Sure, why not? So, uh, if these guys are defending, um, defenders shoot first within each kind of category of unit. So, fortresses always fire first. You can't have offensive fortresses, obviously. <laughs> So uh, what we'll do is you basically roll two dice and you say, I'm going to target either ground unit or air units. Sorry, it, ground units and air units. I'm pointing at the wrong things. And that's going to determine how many dice you actually roll. So uh, a, a fortress 
is going to hit on twos or less against air units, or fours or less against ground units. So obviously going to attack the ground units, right? So I'm going to roll two dice, needing fours or less, and I rolled two hits. Uh, if there were multiple ground units, you have to take the hits on the strongest ones. Uh, but in this instance, there's only one, so I'm going to take one hit, and I'm going to take two hits. So next in the order, again, in the rulebook, not in the play aids, is, uh, is air forces. So the air force is going to attack, and they're going to attack ground. Uh, all of these are ground units, so they just have the same to hit. And uh, air on ground, not good. I'll be honest, it's not good. And so they hit on ones. Air against air, hit on threes. They're good against that. But, so they're going to roll three dice needing ones. Oh, that one's cocked. All right. And these dice have the symbol on the one side, which is um, heresy. So if you make dice, don't do that. So they scored one hit, and again, it has to go on the biggest, the strongest of these two. Defender gets to choose uh, if it's the uh, fortress or the tank. Fortress is already fired, they'll just pop it on the fortress. Then we go to tanks. Tank's going to shoot ground, uh, because let's make sure that that's what they're going to think. They, I think that's all they can roll against. Uh, tanks roll ground two, yes. So ground two, and those are... Those are Russian tanks. We'll roll the Russian dice. So they need two or less to defeat that infantry. Nope, both miss. Then we go to infantry. And because we both have infantry, defender always fires first. So defender's infantry is going to fire. Defender's infantry hits on a ground three. We've got one dice on a ground three. Let's go. Yes, we hit. And so this is destroyed. They don't get to fire back. It, these guys were attacking them. These guys now, he doesn't have any support, he's got to fly on home and rebase, and that's the end of the combat. You only do one round of combat. That's one thing that's very cool about this game. Um, there's no, you don't go multiple rounds like in other block games, you do one round of combat. And that's because you've got the seasons to push the attacks. So you do that in spring, great. Well, if the Japanese desperately needed to take that, now in summer they've got to launch another offensive in there. If we had come to a stalemate and we'd still had kind of ground units in there, um, then we could bring more in, uh, or we could just do other things, and these would auto activate in the battle phase because we initiated this earlier in the year. And it's it's very cool how you get these ongoing combats, uh, and you just pile more and more in, and things things can get pretty wild. It's it's a very very neat system, but I like that it's you do one round of combat and it's over. And then it's back to your logistics. You've got to make that happen and keep it progressing. Because the scale of this is not just like, it's not like one battle of Kursk. It's like taking a whole country-sized region, basically, at times. So it's, it's, a, it's a, at the scale, it's very interesting. Once you've done all your combats, it's basically end of year. You move on to the next year and you do it all again. Uh, it's, it's a very, very neat game. And there's a lot going on. The two proxy powers of Nationalist China and Communist China are a huge part of this. Really appreciated the treatment of that. Those are controlled by the US and Russia respectively, and especially for the Russians, that's a huge focus of what they're doing, because they don't have a whole lot of territory and forces that they're going to do a lot with until late in the war. But uh, that's going to be a massive part of what's going on, trying to defeat both the nationalists and the Japanese, and the Japanese trying to defeat the nationalists and the communists, and the nationalists are desperately trying to kind of like hang on, do as much damage to both sides as possible, and when the US enters, everything's been whittled down and they can just kind of mop up. Very, very interesting uh, concepts in this one. So let's get back to uh, our final thoughts. So that was a look at the map. Uh, I had a blast playing this. We played for like Six hours, yeah. and it was very enjoyable. And I think, okay, I think I may have enjoyed it more than Triumph and Tragedy, but only because I was more comfortable with the rule set. Yeah, yeah they, because both very that good. Before, which you had never. No, I had never played that. Yeah, and because because the, there's a lot of stuff in here that's like just slightly different from like mm -hmm. other CDGs and other war games. Like just enough where you're like. Okay, I'm, I'm worrying about slightly different things and the way that you calculate these and what you're looking at on the board. Just a little bit different, and so I'm, I'm, you know, a little bit more comfortable. So I was like, okay, I 
kind of know what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Right. I still spent the most of the of the game in the rule book because it's not my favorite rule book in the whole world. Yeah, it's not. I don't think it's very, very well organized, frankly, and. I think the reality of it, there's a lot of exceptions. You know, when you're doing yeah. this, this happens. And if it's this year, this it's there's just a lot of that. And, yeah. and it's kind of unavoidable in creating a realistic and you know, treatment just, of this. Inexplicably, they wasted half the player. Age. Yeah, with the like, setup. With the setup. I'm like, yeah, they're, they're, they're going to way more information. Yeah, Which, like, this was very or helpful. you just need one copy of that. Yeah, right. Do do one big copy and, and then give me more info on the inside of this. Yeah, you, so here's, here's what needs to be on the inside of the play aid. There needs to be um, the the battle procedure, yes. the right. order of units. I, from what I can tell, it's only in the rulebook. We had to c consult the well, Bolshevik there's playbook for that. combat sequence right here. But, but that doesn't tell you the fire order you the of the units. Fire right. You're right. And then it needs a victory point schedule as well, so that everyone can see yep. it. So you can kind of track it as you're going yep. a little bit or, just, or better calculate yeah. it. And then uh, I think... Yeah, this is really just... its It was used the first 15 minutes to set up and then we never <laughs> looked at it again. And then it needs to have the the DOW rules on it. Right. Declaration of War. Yes, because uh, I'm going to go ahead and like never look at this for the rest of the game. I'm only going to look at the Declarations of War at most twice, yeah. but that's twice as much as I'm going to look at the setup. Right. So, that, you know, there's <laughs> some... Someone on BGG is going to fix that. <laughs> yeah, they, I, and my guess is there's already good. But yeah, the rulebook itself is only what, player... at, at most like 26 pages of actual rules, but it was kind of like, it was organized a little bit weird, and it was kind of mm -hmm. hard to reference at times. And with the little, the exceptions and stuff, it was like I, I was looking at the rules the whole time. Yeah. Which was frustrating, but it was still very, the actual gameplay itself was enjoyable. I'm, you know, looking at my hand of cards, being like, mm -hmm. what am I trying to do with this? Yeah. Like, I yeah. play a card and I'm like, I don't know if I even want to do a defensive. Why did I do that? Yeah. Like, it, you get some of that angst from some of these cards. It, you know, you get a good card draw and you're like, sweet, yeah. I got all this industry. I'm going to bump a technology. I'm going to bump up my industry. And I'm going to do a couple of offensives. Some hands, you're like, yes, it's very obvious what I should do. Yeah. And there are other hands where you're like... I was trying to draw for diplomacy. I didn't pull a single one for the little yep. region that I was trying to influence. And now I have what like a hundred different offensives, right. which I can't do with my units. And you've got a hand limit that you got to discard down <laughs> yeah, to. So like, oh, I, I think money? your word angst was a very good one yeah. because there were times where I was just like fretting. How many cards do I get? And, and I would change it in my mind 15 times. And I, I know I was going to build six units and then I've got five points left. What am I going to do? Am I going to take five... Yeah, of investment, or am I gonna you know split them up? And but well, what if I don't get the com command card I want? And, yeah. and and I need to do this move. That was I loved that part of it, and I love that part about any CDG. Frankly, it's yeah. that management of your hand and mitigation of the disasters, and yeah. trying to capitalize on when it's good and it works. So right. I really enjoyed this too. Had a good time. It was great to play with you. And yeah, you. it was. I mean, I don't do a whole lot of face to face gaming, so this was mm -hmm. good to play. Especially like multiplayer, um, yeah. and I think for card-driven games or card-driven type games, it's important to see the cause and effect. Because I don't know, sometimes I feel like uh, maybe I'm my dense hominid brain. I don't, I don't recognize like if I play this, how is this going to have a downstream like effect? This was even for the first time playing the system, pretty obvious about mm -hmm. what you needed to do. I mean, it's still there's still a lot of decision points and things don't pan out, but how the mechanisms feed into each other yes. and the cause and effect, I think were pretty, not straightforward, but were easily identifiable and, and helped me make the decisions that I needed to make. Yeah, in a game where you're trying to spin a number of plates with your resources, population, industry, military units, military moves, technologies, um, I feel like after, you know, if you've never played this, after you've played like one or two years, it makes itself obvious to you how, you know, if I push this button, it does this. Mm. And then if I push this button, it does this, which means I'm not doing this one. Like, it it doesn't try to, like, secrete itself away. Now, how right. you execute those, and you might have some terrible card draws is a different story, but it's not trying to, like, hide itself away from you. It's kind of your own that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, there's where, a, where you build an engine. Or, I mean, yeah. it's not a deck builder. Not in that way, but you build... Because if you drop one component, like, 
you, you may have all the resources and population in the world, but if you're not building them like the industrial infrastructure, yeah, well, or that doesn't you matter. can build as many factories as you want. If you don't have people, but if in you them, don't have got the coal to go in them, or right. the people to go in them, it's not going to pan out. Yeah, that matter. that concept of the lower of those two, your industry or your population, and that's the way you get your money is very. I like or, it. Or a when lot. you declare war, and then it's yeah. the lower of the three, and your resources are like, uh oh. Yeah, right. it you use all my oil and rubber, can't build any more yep. <laughs> That trifecta of balancing those three things is forces very to, cool. It forces you to play, not conservatively, but in a balanced manner. Yes. You just can't go hog wild and just do one thing and be a one-trick pony and say, I'm going to win yeah. the game like this. You, you, you'll you suffer the consequences. And in this, the, both the U.S. and the Russian factions also have, like, they've got their three markers, and they also have two markers for their... Chinese nationalists or communist faction too. So I'm trying to spin my own little plates and those little proxy war plates as well. Right. And which... trying to disrupt him spinning his plates. Yeah. yeah. Then disrupt... yeah. <laughs> or at least really slow, slow him down, right? right. Sl slow the Japanese down. So yeah, very good. I enjoyed it. Would play it again in a heartbeat. In fact, yeah. I think the second and third plays are going to just be yeah, as it is with all different. of these, right? Yeah. You've learned, you've learned a lot in that first play. So yeah. you approach it, you know, better, more well informed yeah. about what works and what doesn't. Yeah, dice rolls, dice rolls. Don't work. <laughs> right, it was uh, awful. Is what it is. I've never seen. Well, I literally at one point so took bad. the dice and threw them across the room. <laughs> I did, and I found them and I brought them back over. They are over in punishment. I, 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 They're uh, on the yeah. floor. I don't I, want I to touch those. No, yeah, they could. But it didn't help that with my Chinese boards, I was. Oh my gosh! I was, I, roll two hits every time, yeah. and then. Like nineteen to twenty dice, needing ones, you should roll at least three. And I have rolled zero, nine. right? Multiple it, times in the game. Yeah. So, so we talked about that as well. There's other games that we've played where you have like, oh, if you roll twenty dice, you're gonna get four hits, and it, you do like a, a what's the word I'm trying? Like yeah. Pre-programmed. There's, the, there's like combat matrix of where you're just like. That might, you know, that might have helped me considerably. I'm sure there's an option. Yeah, I, or, yeah. you could Someone easily, right? Yeah. I think there were three or four attacks in a row oh, at yeah. one point where I think I hit once. And that's and was rolling fifty you know, dice. Part of the game, sure. Yep, yep. But like retrospectively, you're like, okay, you know, luck of the dice. But if it's those gonna, had gone differently, yeah, the outcome of this game looks very different. Yeah, because you would come yeah. to China with faster. those more efficiently. Yep. I would have probably went further. for India. He can't pump all the resources into nationalist China. Right. So now he's like, great. What do I do now? Yeah. So then he's starting to do other things, and it just I would have it just up, looks different. I would have right? set up a Central Pacific uh, picket line and just bum rush New Delhi. That's right. what I would have done, and it would have it would have been different. Yeah. It would have been cool. So next time, you know what? I'll try something different. That that's the cool thing about try this. rolling better. Right? Yeah, <laughs> I'll try harder <laughs> next time. Get but, loaded dice. Yes. Yeah, great game though. Uh, yeah, I had great fun with it. Enjoyed I had it. a very enjoyable time. So if you've got three players. Conquest and Consequence is, you know, it's that TNT system, but you got it in the Pacific. And like you said, I really enjoyed the focus on the Chinese Civil War. Yeah. Because oh, yeah. in so many games, it is either it's just a not existent, yeah. right? it's, not, it's not in Axis and Allies mm -hmm. at all, or it's some weird... Well, it is because you have two planes sitting in the middle of China, but, but nothing... They're, but they're yeah. US controls. Yeah, you're like, right. It's not, right. You're it's right. not a There's, thing. Yeah. Right. And... Uh, and you know, other games, it's so abstract Roll that you're just kind of like, what's this weird little mechanic on the side? But here it was such a focus. It was yeah, really interesting to actually kind of play this because I don't know if I've played any Chinese Civil War games. Really. Right. And this honestly yeah. felt like a Chinese Civil War game for I me. I would agree. At least. I would agree. Right. Yeah. So that was very. That was a really cool element to this. Keep in mind, though, this is an inexpensive game. We we, sure. we talked. It's it's almost a hundred dollars, I think, if you didn't get it on the P five hundred. Right. And, and why is that mounted map board? Right. Three hundred and twenty two. An ungodly amount. Wooden of wood, blocks. Yeah. And, you, and you have to do the blocks because it. I mean, yeah, it's a block hidden. game. It's yeah, the, it's. And I love that. I love the three different viewpoints where I can't see Alexander's units because he's got them. It's just really cool. Right. I was I was com I was commenting to you about like the rule book is telling me where <laughs> to sit. Here. I'm like, no, I don't need to sit on one. Hat. <laughs> like I'm like, oh, okay, right, that makes sense with the perspective. Like, yeah, okay. yeah. But it, it's a nice game, right? It, the, the cards these are so thick. Oh we've gosh. shuffled these a hundred times, and they've. Not even. It's like you worn. can't break the cards; you break your fingers. Yeah, right. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, it's it's a, an expensive game, but yeah. you're getting w what you're paying for. And because it's a sandbox game, there's the replayability if you have the players. 
Oh, I yeah. can see it. Yeah, being... if this is a regular game in your group, man, one yeah. decision here or there changes the entire game and the course of the game. Right? Yeah. And, and I do think once you get the rules, it's a three, three and a half hour game. Probably, yeah. You know, yeah, if you maybe remove... four. Yeah, because I'm but... sat here agonizing things and looking at the rules <laughs> and agonizing again. But yeah, it's yeah. It, it, you could you could get it to a short... What do they say? Do they say anything? Usually, uh, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Four to six hours. Yeah. Right. So we were... But yeah, you, we could were... Get it, you could get it to the four. We did, yeah. we did six. Yeah. So I, I enjoyed it. Yes. Great time with Conquest of Concerts from GMT. So check it out if you're interested. Appreciate you guys tuning in. I've been Alexander from PlayersAid.com. I'm Grant. And I'm Ryan.